Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ndidi. I'm a medical SLP. SLP stands for speech and language pathologist. If you came to this video, you know what it means. Okay, so today I'm going to be answering your questions. A lot of you guys have been sending me in specific questions like you'll DM me on Instagram. So I have a few people here that I am going to read your questions and then I'm going to answer them for you the best that I can um, with my experience. So. Maybe as a little bit of background. I've been a medical SLP for two years and about four months. I started off as a CF at an early intervention, so with pediatrics. So they were 0 to 18 months. Uh, I did my CF in a private practice. From the private practice, I started searching for hospitals. I really, 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 really wanted to start off my CF in a hospital, but it was very difficult to enter into a hospital straight away because I was coming from New York City to California. So nobody really knew who I was. I was kind of like fresh faced. So I had to take what I could take. And what I found was a private clinic, early intervention. And then from there, I after I finished my CF, after I got my C's, I decided I wanted to start applying at each hospital, uh, see if they had any openings for speech and language pathologists, licensed speech language pathologists. And luckily for me, I found a position at a, they call them LTAC, so at a long-term acute care facility. I found a position there and I love it. I still love it, I'm still there. Um, I'm, but my position changed to per diem now, so I'm there as needed. And now I've moved on to a different place. I'll, I'm not gonna let you know where I'm working now. <laughs> But let's just say I'm now at a level one trauma hospital, so things are changing, girl. Things are different now. Um, so I'm going to have more stories and different things, different perspective for, for you guys. Uh, at the long-term acute care center, of course, I was dealing with a lot of ventilator patients, patients who are geriatric, patients who are like very, very close to passing away. Um, a lot of people who are very critically, critically ill. I saw the sickest of the sickest patients. I did that happily for two years plus and I'm still glad to go back and do some more. Um, but yeah, let's get into the question. So that was just a background about me. So you guys know who I am, you know like my story, where I've been. I didn't, I also didn't have an undergraduate in communication sciences and disorders. My undergraduate was in anthropology and communication, but I really enjoyed linguistics and things relating to that. So communication sciences and disorders wasn't too far off. I also took a lot, I was into nursing also in undergrad, so I took a lot of science classes. So when I was applying uh, to my grad school, there weren't a lot of missing courses. In my first video, I, I had a list the SLP, like the SLP programs, like uh, their whole criteria, everything like that. So you can go back, or I'll refer to that video so you can go click on there and, you know, click on the helpful links. But yeah, let's get into the questions. So this question is from Lorena, Lorena OC. She's saying that she loves my videos, I'm an inspiration, and she needs a day or a week in the life. <laughs> Um, it's not necessarily a question, it's just like an ask, like she's asking if I could do a day or a week in the life. I am in the works, this is in the works. It, you know, it's difficult in the hospital to be trying to like vlog or record. So it's gonna be, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna figure out the best way to show you guys like what's going on, like and give you guys like a run through without any HIPAA violations or any, you know, seeing patients. We, we're not doing that over here. We're trying to keep our job. <laughs> so. Next question, I screenshotted the questions, comes from Carmen Santiago. She said, I'd love to see a video on your expectations working in the field versus your reality. So when I was coming in from early intervention from that setting, uh, going into the hospitals. I'm trying to think back like what I was thinking about. Um, 
my mom is a nurse so I kind of have an idea of like the hospital setting so because I've visited her a couple of times while she's at work she worked in the ICU so I could kind of get the feel of like kind of how it was going to be but I had no idea um so my expectations were literally like zero I didn't I didn't know what was going to hit me the reality of the situation is it is very fast paced it is very um there's a lot going on there's always a lot of sounds it's very busy it's a uh, very um <laughs> you could say it's a little bit chaotic there is um it's fast paced of course there's not a lot of downtime it's always like go 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 you're always on the go um there's always something to do there's always someone to talk to someone to say hi to people always need you like someone's always gonna like try to grab you and say like oh is such and such needs this can you go see this person can you go see that person it's, it's kind of difficult to explain the reality of the the situation working in a hospital as medical SLP if you are not if you haven't seen it for yourself and put yourself in the situation once you are in there and you as yourself live that situation then you'll completely understand you'll have a better understanding of where I'm coming from as far as like the medical setting once you get in there because um, it's really hard to explain how it's gonna be from coming from the outside because you won't know until you're actually in there um, I think that's the best way to put it like you're not gonna know what's gonna go on unless you go inside <laughs> People can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. You can watch a lot of videos about it, but you won't know until you actually are there. But from what I can say, it's it's a little bit, it's more chaotic than like a private practice. It's um, like, you know, there's doctors, you, you have to get to know all the doctors, you get to know all the nurses, you get to know all, uh, you get to know the dietitian really well. Um, you get to know your respiratory team really well. You are you know just on the go you're independent so you have your list of patients or you know who you're gonna see and marking them off me when I go in like beginning of the day I'll get my my evals check my evals check who are my treatments and then I'll go check on each patient see how the patient's doing like just pop my head in look like see are they okay are they do on dialysis are they doing that doing this it's a lot um, that's all I can say it's a lot but if you are if you love that type of energy if you um, like if that's what drives you then you'll you'll love it you'll love it if if that's your that's your thing then you're gonna like it I got a lot of questions from a girl on Instagram she was a sweet girl um, so she sent me a list of questions me a whole list like this so I'm gonna answer them as best as I can so question number one is is it challenging to obtain a position as an SLP in the hospital slash clinics challenging yes you have to prepare yourself you have to put yourself in a good position um, you have to you know bolster your resume make sure that you they see you as uh, competent and a candidate who is ready to take on the challenges of being in that setting so you can't just be any I don't know you got to be prepared and they have to know that you're prepared so you taking courses you interning you shadowing is all gonna help so um, as I said in previous videos prepare yourself take all the courses that you can if there are Lane Murphy's classes that you can take take those um, do your MBS IMP become certified and, and as many things as you can um, do all of that work uh, while you're applying in hospitals and clinics because it is kind of difficult to obtain a position if you don't know someone or um, yeah like as far as California say if you want to put a, like a county position I know that is difficult you apply and then you can wait years to get a response back um, 
just it's just all on your resume, how you present yourself in interviews, um, your experience, uh, your undergrad, you like what you did in undergrad, what you did in graduate school, all of these things matter. So while you are in these positions, so say you're in, in undergrad right now, everything that you you're doing has to be intentional. You have to have a goal in mind. You uh, say you are an undergrad and you still don't know if you want to do um, hospital versus schools. Um, you're going to have to make a decision to do some shadowing at each, see which one you like better. And then say your, your mind is set on being a medical SLP. That's what you want to do. Everything you do from there on out has to be intentional. You have to take certain courses, get as much experience as you can. Make sure when they look at your resume, they are in awe. They're just like, wow, you did it all. <laughs> like You did the most. In the past, when I got interviewed, people were very impressed that I went to Columbia University. And at Columbia University, I was fortunate enough to go to Ghana. And we did the advanced cleft palate. Um, research clinic type of thing there so people are people are impressed by the things and experience that you have so keep that in mind so in your opinion what environment do you think is the best to work as an SLP <laughs> schools hospitals or private clinics you know I'm gonna be biased <laughs> I don't like schools okay not that I don't like them I do like schools, but I'm reserving schools for my later years, like after I have kids and stuff. If I need to settle down and have like a more easy, laid back kind of job, then I will do schools like later on. Or I'll do like a private clinic because that's the most laid back <laughs> to me, to me. Uh, working in early intervention, I had my own office, I had all my stuff there. It was like easy breezy, uh, you know, someone was making my schedule for me. I would just, the kids would just come in, I would work with them, they would leave with their parents. Just, it was, it was, I was just like, oh, this is happy, happy, joy, joy. If you don't want too much stress in your life, I would say, uh, pick a, like a private clinic or, um, I don't have too much experience with schools except for my internship and that was in New York City, so... Maybe I have a, um, <laughs> maybe I don't have the best view, um, but I prefer, of all these places, what's the best place to work, of the best place for me to work is the hospital because it's very challenging, um, very rewarding, I just feel like I'm making such a big difference in people's lives and I feel useful. I feel like I have purpose and I love connecting with the patients and helping improve their lives. It's it's very, 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 um, I just feel really good inside. I feel like so blessed to be in the position to do these things. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit biased. You know, I love the hospital. That's why I'm a medical SLP girl. <laughs> Is it common for SLPs to open up clinics? Is the business profitable? It's profitable. <laughs> I I know 100% it is profitable. I could just say that off the bat. Uh, if you set your business up correctly and if you have a good business plan and you have a good focus and you have a clientele, so you have a group of people that are going to come back, keep coming back, business is definitely profitable. Um, and I think it's, I don't know if it's necessarily like super, super popular for SLPs to open up clinics, but I have seen quite a few people open up their own like private clinics. So if you're, if you're into the business side of things, definitely look into that. And if you feel like you have a good business plan, if you feel like you have something to offer that's different from other places, say you have a specialty, um... For example, uh, I think there's someone I know who's doing like like a voice clinic, something like that, with actors and actresses. Like something like niche, something different, then yeah, sure, do it. Or even just, 
if you if you have a clientele and you know they'll come back to you so you've been working like home health or something and your base they, they want to keep coming back to you somehow and you're like oh I got enough money I'm ready let me just open up a clinic let me see you know these people are gonna come to me what is the entry-level salary for a speech language pathologist entry-level salary so it depends on what state you're in I'm in the state of California so as an entry-level SLP as a CF I think um, my salary was around 70 to 80,000 and then as an SLP your salary will range from 90 to 100,000 around there so that is like entry level and beyond um, as you get more years of experience or you you know do more things your pay can go up if you have more experience um, hourly rate could range from uh, like 40, 40 the low end for California would be like a 45 and then higher in like up to 65 70 dollars an hour so between that range so it all depends on what you're doing if you're working PRN you can be in the higher range if you're doing full-time you might be somewhere in the middle of that um, if you're just starting off they might try to start you lower depends on which state you're in so these what I'm saying might be higher than where you know say you live like in Texas or you live like in Idaho things might be a little bit lower based on you know based on where you live is there a big increase in pay if you are bilingual I think you do get paid more if you are bilingual so if you are coming to California Definitely, definitely, definitely um, learn Spanish, brush up on your Spanish, that would be a plus. If you're going somewhere where there's like Canada or something, brush up on your French, get you get you some French speaking friends. Um, it's a plus to be bilingual in a hospital setting. Uh, there's nothing worse to me than <laughs> going into a patient's room and then like not being able to communicate with them them not feeling comfortable communicating with you especially if they're a Spanish speaking or you know Korean speaking different languages like that I love when my patients are comfortable enough to communicate back and forth with me um, and if I can't speak their language I'm gonna be using an interpreter because um, I know that's a, a barrier in communication and we're supposed to be the communicators we're supposed to be you know making everything flow I think you do get paid maybe like two to five dollars more per hour if you're bilingual what is your top pro and con about your job my top pro about my job I think I already said it um, I just feel so blessed to being in a position to help people um, and help them recover uh, I just feel like it's the ultimate blessing like I, I'm not deserving of any of it but God put me in this position to do this and I feel like that's the ultimate blessing I just feel so rewarded and I feel like very purposeful that's my top pro top con <laughs> what is what does that even mean what's a top con <laughs> a con of working as a medical SLP a con um okay not everything in life is all roses <laughs> I really do love what I do though um I'm trying to think of a, something that's a con mm, something that I get annoyed by sometimes is having to deal with uh <laughs> people having people questioning my judgment or questioning like um, my recommendations that that can be annoying but you just have to kind of sometimes you kind of have to take a L and just see what happens for example let me give you an example so I see that this 
this man he is intellectually disabled you know he can't speak for himself um, but I give him a recommendation to start eating I said okay he, he can start eating. he doesn't have he's a dentalist doesn't have any teeth he can start eating um, some pureed food with some thin liquid I'm feeding him he's eating really well he doesn't have any problems swallowing looks good check chest x-rays are clear no focal pulmonary processes nothing he's good but I come back the next day and um, <laughs> he has an NG tube as well so I make the recommendation for him to start eating he has an NG tube in dietary is supposed to then follow up see how much he's eating and make give the recommendation to the doctor to remove the ng tube okay so i come back the next day the cnas are telling me like oh he's not eating oh he's choking oh he's doing this oh he's doing that. oh my god he cannot eat i'm so afraid to feed him I oh he cannot eat this <laughs> this is what i be getting annoyed at i come back to this guy's room and i say oh you know what maybe it's my bad maybe my um, evaluation maybe like I just missed it come back so let me treat him again let me see giving him food again doing some strategies with him <laughs> no problems it's it's a whole bunch I had to get I, okay so this happened I like okay he's fine with eating and then they keep reporting the nursing keeps reporting to the dietary that the, he's not eating oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god so dietary is just like oh we we need to remove the ng tube and then we're gonna we're gonna peg him we're gonna peg him <sighs> this pisses me off because I'm like this man can eat there's no need to do a major surgery to do to get a peg there's no need anywho Fast forward, she's she's recommending Peg. I'm like, he can eat. I have to get the dietitian and the doctor to come watch him eat. And from them watching him eat, they decide that, okay, they're no longer going to go with the Peg. They're <laughs> and they're finally going to remove the NG tube and they're going to allow him to eat. That's a win, but the whole process was annoying it's annoying when you have people questioning you or people who are just like especially if the person has um covid history of covid a lot of the nursing staff does not want to go in there and they do not want to feed them it's a reality i'm just telling you how it is they don't want to like if it's an isolation room where they have to gown all the way up and then go in there and feed them, take the time and feed them, a lot of them, they don't want to feed them. So they will make excuses and say like, oh, this patient is doing this and that and that and that and that. And sometimes those patients will end up having surgeries that they don't need to have. It's like if they can eat, let them eat. That's my standpoint. <laughs> but anyways, that, that was a long little rant. But... Those are the kind of annoyances, I would say, are cons, my top con about working in the field. You just, sometimes people are not on the same page with you. They are, they have their own agenda. But all in all, I love working as a medical SLP. I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. What do you regret the most on your journey to becoming an SLP? What do I regret the most on my journey in becoming an SLP? I feel like I don't have any regrets on my journey in becoming an SLP because everything, every step I took um, was intentional. Every step I took had a purpose and um, it brought me to where I am right now. So I don't regret anything um in my journey maybe when I was in grad school I could have <laughs> grad school was kind of a <laughs> okay my only regret was in grad school Michelle Troche she's very 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 popular very very like an awesome 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 professor awesome person awesome everything she had a clinic and I signed up to be in the clinic 
it was for EMST and oh man <laughs> I was going through a lot when I was in grad school I had a lot of medical issues um, if you guys know look at my past videos you'll know what happened to me when I was in grad school I had a lot of medical issues but still we were, I think we were supposed to meet at a certain time to meet up for her clinic to be I was supposed to become one of her researchers um, but I showed up I think I showed up like 10 minutes late because I was doing something was happening what? but I showed up late and that I do regret because from there because I showed up late it was like curtains for being one of her in her on her team but I mean I still got the chance to be one of her students learn from her and all that so I'm not mad at it but I guess you could call that a regret I feel like live life without regrets just they're just mistakes that you can learn from okay how is the job outlook increasing or decreasing should we contact Google <laughs> I don't because I don't want to say something uh, that's not true so I went to the Bureau of Labor and Sanitation I'm here on this site and we're gonna read about the job outlook for speech language pathologists I'll also link this below so it says um, median pay is 80,000 80,480 per year so median means like everywhere so 80,000 um, 38 dollars per hour that's the median pay you gotta have your masters job outlook for 2020 to 2030 is 29 percent much faster than average so it's growing at a rate of 29 percent so it's growing girl it's growing much faster average than other jobs so total occupations they're growing at an eight percent rate you can see it in red there can you see that healthcare diagnosing and treating practitioners they're growing at a rate of 12% and then speech language pathologists growing at a rate of 29% which is much higher than um, all other occupations so it says as the baby boom population grows older there will be more instances of health conditions such as strokes or dementia which can cause speech or language impairments um, speech language pathologists will be needed to treat the increased number of speech and language disorders in the older population. So the geriatric, geriatric population is increasing, so the baby boomers are getting older and we're going to be needed to treat them. Increasing by a rate of 29%, so the outlook is amazing. <laughs> so if you want to become an SLP or if you're thinking about it, come join us. We, meet, we need more people of color, of course, um, that's one thing I want to stress I want to make a whole video about it because we need some representation we need representation I don't want to be going into the hospital and looked at as a CNA or like someone who I don't know <laughs> I don't know if they see me as like a janitorial staff somebody we need more representation so people can it can be normalized that yeah no I'm the SLP or no I'm the RN or you know no I'm the doctor because we don't need to be disrespected anymore I'm gonna make a whole video on it okay just wait because it's a problem is case overload common is there a way to avoid this I think case overload is common in schools as far as um, medical SLPs we have a different sort of setup where we'll have like teams of SLPs so I know where I'm going there's about three or four of us who share a caseload so um, overload is different you might have a day where there are a lot of patients to see but um, as you go through the days maybe your caseload will decrease as you finish all of the, all of the treatments and say it becomes overwhelming they can always bring in someone from um, the PRN staff to help you. You can always ask for help. So are majority SLP jobs salary based or hourly based? Hmm. I think schools, they're salary based. Um, and 
as far as hospital setting I feel like we're more hourly based so we'll have an hourly rate for hospital settings or if you are a contracted employee you should be hourly based it depends on where you work is the job stressful scale it 1 out of 10 10 being the most stressful hmm. <laughs> stressful I would say being an SLP stress wise right in the beginning say your first year stress levels are gonna be around six or seven medical SLP your second year stress levels should be around maybe a three or four it should be a lot easier you already know the ropes you already know what you're doing so stress should be about three four probably about like a four because there are going to be some stressors that come up say you have to do a fees um, depending on the patient depending on their background their their medical history uh, sometimes things come up that can be like stressful or can be like oh god like how am I gonna do how am I gonna deal with this uh, something new last place there was a man who I think he had pancreatic cancer so he only had a few more months or weeks or however much time to live and he was on a regular diet with thin liquids but he wasn't eating anything because he had no appetite, he felt nauseous. Um, I just felt really bad for him. I didn't want to change up his diet too much because you know he was all already getting G-tube feeding he was just kind of wasting away um, so that that is a, a stressor where you feel like you know what can I do for this man what can I how can I improve his quality of life but some of those kind of things it's just like it is what it is like you know life is taking over so for him I remember um, I was like so um, because he was, he was saying he gets nauseous and then he also was having pain when he's eating. He said, but when he drinks liquids and stuff, it's a lot easier. So I was like, okay, well, we can try some soups for you. Just something soothing. Some water. You know, you can have whatever you want. Have your family bring in some stuff. Just anything to make him more comfortable. Um, so yeah, stress. Second, third year should be around like a four. Four out of ten. Um, and stressors are just like things that come up um, or say your <laughs> say your doctors order like 10 evals in a day on a Monday and you're just like oh lord <laughs> but it's all about how you handle your stress and how you compartmentalize and how you plan things out if you come up with a good plan then your stress will decrease and you won't be like freaking out like just don't freak out you can handle it you got it uh, what are some day-to-day -day tasks for an SLP um, in the hospital so day-to-day -day tasks as a medical SLP in the hospital so you're gonna come in ready for work you say oh hey oh hey <laughs> say hi to your nursing staff with soup with a zoo nice to see you uh, look at your board, see who's there that day, then you're gonna go into your little office, your wherever you guys do your stuff. Um, say hi to your rehab staff. Hey PT, hey OT, hey PTA, hey rehab tech. <laughs> say hi to everybody. Then you're going to check your evaluations for the day. So whatever system you have, you look in your system, you check your evals for the day. However, however many the doctors have ordered for that day, you look at it, make sure you know what it's for, if it's for swallowing, it's, if it's for um, one-way speaking valve, you know, whatever it's for, cognition, um, whatever it's for you to figure it out. And you have your evals and you have, you check all your treatments for the week. So you're going to have people in your caseload that need treatments. You know what it's for. So you either write it down or you have a schedule that you've already typed out. You can print it out. Highlight who you, who you want to see. How many treatments how much time plan it out then you go and you look for these people see 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 how they doing that day and then after that you see your patients um, do your treatments have your lunch come back from lunch see more patients and then do your e do 
I usually do my evals like in the beginning of the day just to get it over with because they take more time than treatments. Um, so you see your treatments and then you're out of there. You do so you say bye to everybody. Day usually starts about 8 a.m. ends about 3 p.m. So yeah, that's like a general <laughs> day in the life task um, of a medical SLP. You're going to tasks look like uh, some other mundane things like going to get food from the kitchen and um, getting different consistencies, um, <laughs> getting like oral care, getting some ice from the ice machine, and that's stuff I do every single day. We've come to the end of the questions. Uh, these are all the questions that were sent to me by Miss Aliyah. And I hope I answered them well for you guys. If you guys have any more questions, don't be scared to leave them down below. I'm here. I'm an open book. And um, I want to help you guys get to where you want to go. I think I got a comment that was asking if um, they can shadow me. And shadowing and volunteering and things like that is up to the hospital. So you would have to apply through the hospital and ask them if there's any opportunity for shadowing um, and if they say yes then you can go ahead and shadow. I think I shadowed at like Providence. If you're from LA area you know what Providence is. I, I shadowed there and that was a really really good place to shadow because it's a mix. It's like outpatient clinic so you get to see, you know, a variety of things there. I really enjoyed making this video for you guys. I hope you guys found it informative. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you guys in my next video. Love you so much. Bye. Mm.